Hello, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. Today is one of those episodes where I hope you'll just join me for an adventure. I'm not sure where the Holy Spirit's going to lead this one, but I know it's going to be powerful. It's going to be enlightening. It's going to be inspiring. And I think it's going to kind of transform your thoughts around your faith and how you live your faith and especially how that happens within your business. So we are, well, you know what? I'm going to leave it at that. And we're going to just jump right in. Lori and Trio, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you, Robin. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. I didn't do an introduction of you at all because I wanted you to introduce yourselves, yourself to the listeners and give them a little bit of insight as to who you are and what you're doing because we met, you found me on Instagram and I did one of your interviews live and I just, there was such a connection when we had our first conversation and you really inspired me to step out of my comfort zone in some ways to talk more about my faith. And, you know, it, we go through life and I think God places these callings on our hearts and sometimes we act on them very quickly and sometimes we drag our feet, so to speak. And I've had this pull towards ministry towards, and I don't mean a full on ministry, but just incorporating my faith into my business, letting it be forward facing. And that's not always easy to do because there are obviously are reasons to be afraid that, well, this may sabotage my business because of the world we live in, but you are such a living example of doing what God has told you to do, what he's called you for, even amidst a lot of unknowns, apprehensions. And I'm really excited to just have you tell the listeners a little bit about your journey, and then we'll dive into the meat of the conversation. Yeah, perfect. So I'll start with saying that, I, you know, I started off in acting, which I told you about. And at, at 18, I moved to Los Angeles on a scholarship for an acting academy. Pursued acting for seven years. The Lord said, lay that down, pivoted me to fitness. I ended up becoming a personal trainer, fitness instructor. And then I was the um, resident personal trainer for an international pop group called Blush. And I trained them for all of their tours across the United States uh, for about, I wouldn't say about six months, maybe longer than that. And from there, um, I was going to launch a faith and fitness based business with um, one of my best friends in Houston. And there, there was another pivot there. So for now, I've stepped more into ministry. And I wrote my first book in 2020 called Festival in the Desert, Learning to Rejoice in the Difficult Seasons of Life. And it, it essentially tracks a lot of the hardship that I've personally walked through within a three year uh, span from 2017 through 2020. And then the pivot that you've seen and where we got connected on Instagram, essentially for the live show that I do there, it was God's pull to get me more into essentially full-time ministry, but with a really cool twist because it affects the marketplace a lot. And I've always felt called to ministry, but I've always been very entrepreneurial and I love seeing how I can collaborate with other women and other female entrepreneurs in general. And so what I'm doing now is outside of the book and taking on speaking engagements, the Lord has kind of moved me into this space where I get to connect to incredible entrepreneurs and drive women back to the women that have the resources. And so um, I'm developing a brand called Strength and Glory. Um, that's The Instagram show is based off of that, but it was originally online conferences. And I'm in the process of pivoting and, and figuring out how to take that into a more experiential um, role or platform and really bring women together to create community. I'm really big on community. And what I really want to do is not only build the body of Christ by providing the tangible resources, because I don't want to be the expert in everything, but I want to present the experts to these women so that they can grow in mind, body, and spirit. Um, but also it's, it's an outreach. Um, it's evangelism to those who maybe are in other, you know, field or in, in, in the marketplace. And they're like, Hey, how do I start to integrate God? Maybe I am curious about a relationship with the Lord and, and God's really just done a pivot, even in my heart to become more bold and completely unashamed. 
I've always shown up and shared the Lord, but I think over the last year, it's been this, just this urge to really be completely unashamed about my faith. And so what you see is what you get. Like, I'm just going to share Jesus, <laughs> period. And so that's kind of where I'm sitting now and what I've been working on and, and kind of in the direction where I'm headed. Mm, I love it so much. And it's so needed. We live in a world that is so full of chaos and questionable morals and activities. And I think having more people being brave and bold and courageous to step into their faith and share Jesus is such a powerful gift. Yeah. It's like I said, I've always shared Jesus. I've always had a relationship with the Lord, but this last year, maybe year and a half, it's been like breathing, if that makes sense. Like, Mm -hmm. I just, I can't help it. If I'm going to show up in any way, shape or form, you're going to get Jesus. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm here for it. And it's just learning to lean into the Holy spirit and become more comfortable with letting that be the norm for me and Mm -hmm. letting him lead and guide me in the way that I'm supposed to show up, even in, you know, coffee chats or face-to-face conversations, or whether it's through social media or what he's asking me to put my hand to next, Mm -hmm. it's just leaning in and letting the Holy spirit guide that. And just trusting that if, if he's the one leading me and I'm following, then, you know, it's, it's all going to work out and people are going to be affected for the, for the better. So let me ask you this, because for those people who are listening and I did a whole episode on this and intuition and how really our intuition is the Holy spirit speaking to us. When we are faithful and believe in Jesus as our savior, the Holy spirit is within us and he is guiding us and talking to us. And if we listen, we'll hear him. So, and he speaks to us in different ways, right? It could be through some, through scripture that we read. It could be through a conversation we have. It could be through our thoughts, but for those that are questioning, well, she says that, you know, God told her to quit, quit acting, or God told her to start a fitness facility, or God told her to, you know, now this is what she's doing. So for those people who aren't experiencing this, and I know there's many, And, you know, there's a lot of us who may experience it and we're like, I don't want to do that. Or that's not going to work or, oh, that's impossible. I don't have the skills for that. What do you say to those people? How do you guide them to, to really tap into the resource of the Holy Spirit, but to hear him and to be able to discern that it is indeed him speaking? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple of things that come to mind. So one of the main things is for those who are, are, believers right in walking with the lord getting in scripture to understand how the lord speaks is going to be really vital because it's going to learn to tune your ear to the holy spirit and then asking the holy spirit would you make me sensitive to your voice would you help me to hear you and then another aspect to that is being sensitive so it's not like i hear an audible voice from god right i'm not like jonah barking it over here where i'm like this is what god said it's it's more like there have been moments in my life where i just feel this deep impression you you know you, you've called it intuition but this just unction that this is a step that i need to take and oftentimes when the lord is leading me there's always confirmation a hundred percent there's always confirmation it'll come up again in a conversation where things that i have been talking to god about or praying about somebody will bring up in a conversation completely out of the blue and i have to tune my ear to it so learning to to kind of like let your ears be open to when the Holy Spirit wants to speak. And you're right. He speaks in a myriad of ways. He can actually speak. Sometimes he speaks to me through song lyrics. Sometimes it's through this deep impression. Sometimes it's through dreams. Sometimes it's through like a picture that all of a sudden pops in my head. And I'm like, wait, what was that? Where did that come from? And just learning to lean into that a little bit more. Um, when I was moving out of acting, right, one of the things was my prayer was I wanted to honor God with my gifts and talents where he was calling me. And the roles that I was getting sent out for were starting to go against what I believed in and what I wanted to practice for my life. Another thing to that is like my grandparents helped put me through acting school. My parents were so supportive of me literally leaving behind full, full ride scholarships all over in state for academia because I was like, no, God said to go in acting. And my parents were like, well, we trust you. <laughs> so we're going to help you financially. I, what I didn't want to do was be a part of producing content that would not make my family proud of the investment that they helped make in my education. And so when, when I started to feel the conviction of things going against what I believed was good content, was morally sound content, was edifying content, I began to see that kind of dry up. And so that's always been a sign when 
it's almost when um, his hand is lifted or his grace is lifted off of a circumstance. Maybe situations are starting to dry up. Maybe opportunities are starting to fly, fly, like flatten out. Maybe you're losing something or a, a relationship or a partnership is ending or now you're you're striving in your own power to make something happen and there's not a grace upon it, right? For me, those are telltale signs that the Lord is calling me to pivot. And so what my goal is, is to lean in and say, okay, Lord, this is this a time for me to press in and keep pushing because you're training me in perseverance? Or is this an opportunity for me to sit back and say, how do you want to redirect my steps? And living in a place where you're open and available to pivot as he says. Now, if it's a perseverance thing, he's going to strengthen you and you're going to get the confirmation from people, or maybe it's just this peace that you keep going in the same trajectory, or maybe it's a piece of release and you're starting to get words from people or conversations or things are popping up all around you that are now giving you a new insight or direction or idea that maybe you need to kind of pivot and move in a different direction. To me, that's that's a telltale sign that the Holy Spirit is trying to get a hold of me and re-navigate my path. Um, and so that's, that's one way. So going back to scripture, really immersing yourself in the word, really trying to understand his voice, asking the Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? Would you teach me and train me how to hear your voice? And I always pray this, God, give me sensitivity to hear your voice and to know the difference from the counterfeits from yours and make me in tune to you because I want to obey you, right? It's a heart posture. And then the third is just being open and then following that and you'll get confirmation. There'll be, usually mine come in three or four. Sometimes it's more because he really needs to get my attention. And then other times looking at like certain cutoffs, like when I was pursuing the fitness business with my friend in Houston, that completely dried up there. It was just, it was this insane battle. And there was no, there was nothing else that I could produce. I was doing everything in my own strength. And it was at that time that I was like, Lord, I don't want to do it in my strength because then your power is not going to be behind it if I'm the one doing it all myself. So I had to surrender that. And the surrender came with laying that down, laying that dream down, laying that vision down. And it was heartbreaking and it was hard. And I I battled with it for a while. I fought him on it. I cried. I wept. I got depressed. I did all of the emotions. I went through all of it. But at the end of the day, I knew that obedience in that moment looked like surrender and letting him do whatever he wanted with it. And I think that's now where I'm in a place where I'm able to speak to other women from the standpoint that I am, as it pertains to even strength and glory, it's a rebirth of a previous vision, but in a whole new light. And I think mm-hmm. that if we're open to that, he's going to direct us. I, I love absolutely everything you said. And it's funny because I have had the same experiences. This idea, this feeling comes to mind and I'm like, hmm, was that God? And then all of a sudden in conversations or in what I read, it's like there and it's just boom, boom, boom. That just the solidification of of it. And I think something you said too, that's really, really important is that discernment and discerning that, okay, is this God or is this worldly? And differentiating that because that, or distinguishing between that, because it's so important, we could easily go down the wrong path if we don't ask the Holy Spirit for that clarity and the discernment. The other thing that I want to talk about is um, you, you talked about doing it on your own. And I think especially as women and as entrepreneurs, business owners, we tend to take a lot into our own hands. Mm-hmm. We, a lot of us are type A, a lot of us are perfectionist. And when we, I I know in your book, you talk about this and I would love your perspective on that, on just really, I guess it comes back to what you said, obeying and surrendering. Yeah. But how did you let go of your perfectionism and your desire to control the situations? Because I think, I think it's something that there is. There is scripture to address this, right? And I I would love your perspective on this because I think it's something a lot of us deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. So I'll say this one phrase because this was transformational for me. And when when it was presented to me in this way, it really opened up my eyes to behaviors that I was exhibiting that although good, like on the external, were actually robbing me of joy 
internally with the Lord. And here's the thing. So perfectionism is a perversion of excellence. The enemy can only pervert what God has already done. He cannot create. He's not a creator himself. Only God is creator. So if we start to operate in the mode of perfectionism, we're essentially trying to put ourselves in a place of autonomy or a place above God or an equal to God or saying, you know, I get to be perfect. Jesus is the only one who's ever been perfect that walked this earth. But what he does call us to is excellence. We are called to excellence because we are the light of the world. There are different standards that we are held to um, that we get to exhibit the light and the love of Christ. It's also how we're able to follow the commandments. It's that vertical relationship with God that then translates to the horizontal. So when we show up in life, we're exhibiting the very fruit of the Holy Spirit. We're exhibiting the very nature of God. Within that, if we are operating from a place of excellence, if we're showing up every day and just doing our best, then God rewards that. When we get into the place where we're trying to fight for perfection, we start to get skewed in our thinking that it's dependent on us rather than reliant on the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. And we rob ourselves of the joy and satisfaction of watching God show up because now we think if it's not perfect, it's not good enough. And for me, God had to debunk that. He had to take me back to the core of who I am in him, which stems to identity. So my identity began to be rooted in performance, in my ability to, you know, be called a machine by my friends or be called an executor by my friends or Lorraine is so high performing, da, 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 da. I liked those titles and those accolades because it gave me a sense of self-worth and accomplishment. I took the strengths finder test. I'm a three. I'm an achiever by nature, right? But when those when those areas start to get limited because of our human strength, because we are we are fallible and we are frail, really at the core of our humanity, when those started to be attacked, all of a sudden my very identity was attacked because I'm like, well, I'm a performer. Well, what I do is achieve. Like if I can't achieve because now I'm sick or because X, Y, and Z happened, suddenly I don't have the same value. And that's a, a lie from the enemy. And then it, it perverts our view of what excellence looks like. And I think for us, a way that we can remedy that is every day, the submission and the obedience comes by saying, God, here's what I have in my hands. Here's what you are calling me to, whether it's ministry, whether it's business, whether it's a project, whether it's your family, how are you showing up every day, imperfect, but with excellence? And saying, Lord, how do you want me to show up today? You have the authority and the space to do what you wish with my day. And sometimes he derails us in a way that is so beautiful that we can't be perfect even if we tried, but we learn and we grow and we develop character and we get made more into the image of Christ and we start to bear more fruits of the Holy Spirit through patience, right? Um, and so I think just just to like debunk perfectionism and just like help put some of you at rest is I would say show up and ask the Lord every single day, how can I show up and be excellent? And just kind of lay perfectionism to the side because it's an identity thief. And if your identity is found in what you do and your capacities of what you do, Rather than simply being a child of God, you're going to forever be stuck in a cycle of striving, trying to outrun the grace of God. And you can't supersede the grace of God. But when you're operating from identity of who you are, rather than what you can do, what you end up producing far surpasses um, your, your own strength. Because now God has free reign to kind of go exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask, think, or imagine. Because now he's the one that's pioneering. He's the one that's the wind underneath you pushing you forward rather than striving. And so it's taking a stance of I'm going to stride with you, Lord. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and try and out, out work your grace. I'm going to receive it. And you, you said something earlier, Robin, you said control. I think oftentimes control is based in fear of the unknown and us wanting to have it all put together, right? We want to know that it's, it's covered and it's handled. That actually robs us from surrender because God wants us to live as children. He doesn't want us operating in autonomy. Yes, in power and in strength, but in his, 
right? And so there's a full trust and dependency that has to happen when you're walking with the Lord. And he does more than you could. He can accomplish in one day through your life more than you could in 10 weeks of you just muscling through it. And that's just the grace. That's the grace factor that is there. And so the control is really stemmed in fear. And so one thing I would say is if you're struggling with control, what are you afraid of? And how can you bring that to the Lord and offer it as a surrender and a sacrifice to him so that he can begin to uproot whatever that is? Because it's stemming from somewhere. It's always something deeper. There's always a deeper root of why you need to be in control. And it's usually from a fear-based thing. But we also know that in scripture says there is no fear in love for perfect love casts out all fear. So it's not that God has a giving problem. It's that we as, and I'm going to say this as women, because we're speaking to women, we have a receiving problem. So if we're incapable of fully receiving his grace and his love, our default is going to be fear, which is going to lead to control, which is going to lead to striving, which is going to lead to us feeling like we have to be perfect in order for God to be approving of us. Mm. Gosh, this is so powerful. Okay. I, just for the sake of time, I want to jump to something, um, from the book that you said when you were talking about, um, you know, all of the experiences that you had, and some of them were very hard, very challenging, um, very emotional and you were hurting, but you said numerous times that, you know, and I know this for a fact, but it's really hard to convey that, bad things don't, God doesn't let bad things happen to us, but he uses bad things for our good. And Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of us, that's a really hard concept when you're going through a challenging time, whether it's in life or business, if you're not seeing the results you want, or you are hurting because you're losing someone or relationships are failing or children are sick or whatever the case may be, it's really hard to understand that. And I know I've had a lot of people heard a lot of people say, you know, why did God let this happen? Why is God punishing me? And I would love for you to, to talk about that because you have a beautiful way of saying that, no, that's not what's happening. Yeah. So it's one of the biggest revelations that I had when I was walking through my stuff. And actually I even took a step back and I wanted to take a look at other people's stories too, right? You look at people in in scripture and some of the things that they also faced were so difficult, right? They were so difficult, but every single time you see Jesus, especially, you know, in the new Testament, he always met every single person with love and compassion where they were at, whether it was, the the widow whose son died or the one that was running out of food and was really preparing to die, whether it was, um, you know, Elijah met that one, but with Jesus, so you had the prophets that met those people and, and they were the depiction of Jesus, right? In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, Jesus always met everybody with compassion. So I took a step back and I was like, Lord, your design was never the, the pain and the sorrow and, and just the things that we experience in this fallen, broken world. That happened because of sin. It came into our world because of sin at the fall with Adam and Eve. And so that you promised us hardship, but you also promised us. You also promised us that you would be with us and that you have already overcome the world. So if your plan has always been love, it's always been care, it's always been concern. I have to take a look and say, okay, God, if your goal was to really punish me, you would have never sent Jesus. You would have been saying, die in your sin, in your shame, in your filth, because God, God in his holiness, holiness and sin cannot merge. They cannot blend. Right. And so what I had to learn for myself is God isn't actually punishing me, but because he is sovereign and because he is loving and because he is good, he can take everything that the enemy is planning for evil, every attack every fallout, every death, everything that this earth is ridden with because of sin. And he can use it to mold me and refine me and reshape me. And on the other side of that process, that refining and transformational process, there's a story of victory that'll help bring other people along so that they can experience healing and freedom themselves. And so what began to pull me out of my funk, because I literally was trying to build a mansion in Funky Town. And he was like, you can pitch a tent, but don't build a house. Like, pitch a tent, pack it up, let's move on. I think when we want to sit in those 
seasons for too long, it creates bitterness and resentment because we start to lose sight of the bigger picture of the, the heaven view, heaven perspective of how God can actually use it. But when you step in and you say, God, here's my pain. You're not punishing me. I'm choosing to see you as a good father. Step into my pain with me. Show me where you are in my pain with me so that I can see your love. Help me to receive your love even in this moment. What it does is it opens our eyes to see the ways that he is showing up, the ways that he is providing, the ways that he actually does care and have deep concern and compassion for you. You know, in his scripture, he says that he is near to the brokenhearted and those with a crushed spirit he does not despise. It's, if he was doing that, then I could say he's punishing you. But you even look at the life of, who was it, Job, who lost mm -hmm. everything? Mm -hmm. Like, God, here's the thing. The enemy has to go to God for permission to attack you. He doesn't have free reign as a child of God. He has to go get permission. So he's he's even under the hand of God. God said, you can test my servant. He's, he's not going to turn from me. He knew exactly what Job could handle. He knew what he could handle. And sometimes God allows these trials and they're, I'm not going to lie, they hurt and they're hard, but he wants to build up the, the perseverance and the hope and the character ultimately, right? Because perseverance leads to hope, hope leads to character that will eventually depict God and his glory. And your testimony has so much power when it's placed in his hand, when the pain is placed in his hand. And so I had to learn that for myself. It's not, he's not punishing me. He's walking me through it. He's transforming me. And in the process, there's something probably that he wants to uproot. For me, the pain was uprooting performance. The pain was uprooting perfectionism. The pain was getting to the root of being um, sexually abused as a child and understanding that the shame and the guilt that was still eating at me really deep within was no longer my identity. And I didn't have to operate from a place of trying to earn people's love and respect and value because I'm not that child that was hurt. I'm not, my, I'm not what was done to me. I'm not my circumstances. I am who God says I am. And so the victory on the other side of that is being able to proclaim that loud and proud and watch God show up and change other people's lives on the other side of that. And so it's not, it's not for punishment. It mm -hmm. can be redeemed and God wants to use it to create a beautiful story that'll help bring other people into healing in ways that you couldn't do on your own. Mm, gosh, I love this so much. So now this, Everything that you just said brings me to the last thing that we're going to talk about. And that is, you know, growing up, I was in a church and I, it was a good church, right? But it was very legalistic in terms of, and I think a lot of us grew up this way where, you know, you're, you're implanted with these, these thoughts and expectations that you behave and you make good choices and you do what's right, or you're going to be punished. And, you know, a verse that my mom still to this day throws at us is, um, and she does it with good intent, but it's that the verse of you lukewarm Christians, I spit you out. That created such fear in me and yeah. such shame and such guilt for any time I made a bad decision. And I, what I've learned over the years is that it's not about being perfect. It's mm -hmm. not about completely eliminating sin from our lives because it's impossible because we are human, but it's about having a relationship with Christ so that you can truly understand what his grace looks like. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was, you know, deep into my adult years that I started developing that real relationship. It wasn't superficial prayers anymore. It was a conversation with mm -hmm. God. And I would love for you to talk about that because I think every single thing that you have said thus far during our conversation has, you've been able to say it because you have that relationship. And I just want to encourage people that whatever you've been taught before, whatever seeds have been planted before, remember that Christ's arms are open for you. And he mm -hmm. wants that dialogue with you. He wants a relationship with you. It's not a you versus him. It, he wants you. I would love for you to talk about that. Yeah. So when you asked that question, the first, the first thing that came to mind was David. And for those who have ever read the book of Psalms and also studied the life of King David, we know that 
He was considered a man after God's own heart. But David was also a murderer. <laughs> he was also an adulterer. And people consider him be like, what? He did all these things. Like, this is horrible. And yet God still said he's a man after my own heart. I think that the, the difference is if you, if your heart posture is God, I need you and I want you in my life. I want a relationship with you. The Psalms were dialogues that David was having with the Lord himself. He laid his heart bare. He was talking through his mess. He was like, this is what's going on, but you're still great. And this is what I did, but you're still good. And I think it's that it's, if you are willing to be repentant and turn from what you're doing and let God lead you and guide you, there's a big difference between continuing in your pattern of sin, knowing that it's you're ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you're blatantly being disobedient. That's completely different. Whereas if you fall and you stumble and you make a mistake because we live in a fallen world, but then your heart is broken for what breaks God's heart and there's a repentance about it. And you're like, I don't want to live like this. God, help me navigate this. Please forgive me. Show me how to walk in alignment with your ways. God does something so miraculous in that. And it becomes this relationship where God doesn't come with guilt and condemnation. He, his repentance comes from his loving kindness. It says in his word that your loving kindness leads me to repentance. He's not here to be harsh and mean and condemning. The condemnation actually comes from the enemy trying to entrap you in the shame and the guilt from what you've actually done or walked through or experienced. And that's what shackles you. The freedom in the relationships comes from, okay, Lord, I can actually come to you as messy as I am and present this to you because your goal is not to let me stay the same. It's to transform me. And so if I'm coming with all my mess and I'm saying, here it is, and I'm not afraid to lay it all bare, he can actually take that. And if your heart posture is, I want to follow you. I want to lean into you. I want to have a relationship with you. I desire your things. He will begin to mold and change your heart. So now the internal change is happening to such a degree that the external is changing. The external is changing. And then your actions become different as a byproduct of the internal, but it comes through that dialogue. For me, it was like, okay, Lord, I, I just want to live for you. And I've, I've fallen, I've made mistakes, I've stepped out of line, and I've suffered the consequences of the pain because that's, you will have consequences. Whatever you reap, you will sow. That's a, a biblical principle, right? I have sown certain things that reap certain consequences, and I've had to sit on the other side of those consequences and be like, wasn't the best choice I ever made. Did God shame me for it? No. He was like, see the pain? That pain is let to, meant to lead you back to wisdom. And wisdom is meant to be a fruit of my spirit. And so if I'm leading you back to wisdom, what is that saying about how I really want for you and the guidelines that I want you to walk in line with? What does that really look like? And so he's trying to get me back on his path because in his path is where prosperity and peace and love and grace and mercy abound outside of that condemnation. And so the pain points lead us back to the wisdom that he has for us, but then we can make new choices and those new choices help us then have the dialogue with him. Am I stepping out of line or Lord, is this what you have for me? And if your heart is towards him and saying, I just, I just want to follow you. I just want to be after your heart. I desire a relationship with you. He's going to always bring you back to that place of wisdom and to that place of, I've got you. That was not right let's turn away from that. And now let me show you the way in which you should go. Hmm. Oh, this has been so powerful. I listeners, I hope this has touched your heart. I, I feel like it touched mine on in many ways. And it is remarkable. The whole time I was listening to you talk, Lorraine, I'm thinking, wow, the Holy spirit is working, truly working. Listeners, I know that there's somebody out there that needed to hear this today. Like it, it's just impossible that this is not benefiting someone. So I'm going to ask that if you know someone who's going through stuff or just feels alone or has drifted away, please share this episode because I, there is so much power here. And I know that the Holy Spirit is taking this conversation and he's using it to not only glorify God, but to bring more people in to his community, to his kingdom. Lurleen, Lurleen, will you please tell everyone how they can connect with you? I would love for everybody to follow you and, and be able to watch your interviews on Instagram, but also um, 
I am sure you have an email list and you have some really exciting things coming up that people may be interested in attending or being part of. Yeah, thank you for that. So one way you can connect with me is obviously through Instagram at Lorraine Alexa. That's where all the interviews are housed currently. Um, I'm praying about actually stripping all the audio and turning them all into podcast, Bob, and I'll keep you updated on that because then I'll have a whole new platform. Um, and then I also have my web website, LorraineAlexa.co. There's no M on the end of that because that was taken. Um, but there's um, there's blogs, there's devotionals on there. Uh, once I start launching events again, those details will be up there. You can subscribe to my email list to stay up to date on all of that. And then if anybody's interested in a copy of the book, it's available on almost every single platform. Um, one of the easiest ways to get it is on Amazon, Festival in the Desert by Lorraine Alexa Trujillo. The audiobook should be released soon. It's in its final reviews through ACX. So we should be able to have that soon. And I'm looking to get it translated in Spanish because I did a, a speaking engagement recently that was at a, a bilingual conference and I wish I had Spanish books. So, but those are the main ways. It would be um, Instagram, my website. I have an email list through there. You can also actually email me through my website and connect with me that way if that's a, a preference. And uh, yeah, those are the best ways. So I will definitely put the link to the website in the show notes, as well as the link to the book. And it is so well written. It's beautifully written. I want to commend you on that because it's, it's beautifully written. All right, everyone, that's a wrap for today. My heart is feeling so full right now, and I hope yours is too. If you enjoyed the episode, please be sure to share it with someone else who needs to hear this message, as well as please leave us a rating and review because that's how I can continue to get more incredible listener or guests like Laureen, as well as it helps us be found so that more people can hear messages like this to transform their lives into the the purpose and the hope that God has for them. Thank you for being here and I will see you all next time.